I'll talk now about epidemiology. So I think it's important first to define what is epidemiology. Epidemiology is a study of how a disease spread and affect a population. In details, it means we want to look at where the pathogen survives, when and where it infects, the conditions under which it spread within the plant, between plants, and between locations. As you can see, it's a, it's a set of questions which are extremely important, and behind those set of questions, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We've done a lot of work uh, over the, the, the last three years on the subject, and I want to go through all of it. What I'll try to do is to tell you how we were able to establish the life cycle of PSH, some of the experiments we've done on the survival of PSH, and then finally some work on how the bacteria uh, infect the plant and move in the plant. And of course, the reason we, we want to do all of it is because managing PSA will depend on management decision, and those decisions will rest on the results we're going to get from those epidemiology studies. For example, if you want to know when to spray a product, we need to know when infection is going to occur. That is directly coming from epidemiology studies. And epidemiology is done in a number of ways. It can be done simply by observation and can be done by experiments. And I'll show an example of both. We start with observation, and those are the observations uh, that we made when the disease started in Italy. I was working with people in Italy in 2009, 2010, before the disease was in New Zealand. What we found in Italy is a number of symptoms, like this uh, production of red exudates, from that red exudate, it is extremely hard to find PSF. Red exudate is just a reaction of the plant that says something is happening, and that something can be PSF, but can be physiological uh, factors as well. If you take a little plant, you cut the plant, put it in the fridge, take the plant a couple of hours later, that plant is going to show the same red exudate. There is no PSF. It's a reaction of the plant. And sometimes that reaction is caused by PSA. Next symptoms we had was the discoloration of the tissue underneath the bark. And yesterday we've seen some of that. That indicates that uh, the cortical parenchyma, those tissue, are being colonized and affected by PSA. We can have drops of exudate. You have a drop of white exudate here. Very different from the red exudate. That, red, that white exudate is full of bacteria. It's almost pure culture of PSA. What does that tell us? That tells us that the tissue underneath the bark can contain so much of the pathogen that the pathogen is running out of space and is being extruded out of, out of the tissue. We can have a drop of exudate from tissue that do not show any symptoms. We've got here a cluster of flowers. There is no symptom whatsoever, but those leaves, they are absolutely perfect. And yet, you have here a drop of exudate, pure bacterial culture, with an inoculum that can infect the last part of your orchard. And finally, we have another symptom, which is very important, which is a shoot dieback. And from some of those symptoms, at times you struggle to find any PSA in that part of, of, of the cane. You find it only at the base. That indicates that PSA can also be in the vascular system and can, and can plug the vascular system, leading to wilt and necrosis. If now we put all those symptoms in, 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 in a circle, which represents the year going from fall, winter, spring, and summer, so we have red exudate usually uh, winter and uh, early spring, white exudate in spring, wilting of the shoots later, shoot tips later in its fall. We now interpret the symptoms, and we came to the conclusion that what we have here in, in, in winter, the red exudate, is the reaction of the plant to the presence of the bacteria, because of the low inoculum during winter, because this was observation made in Italy, where winter can be extremely cold, 
we came to the, to the conclusion that infection probably took place during the fall and at harvest. However, we know that later on we have a white exudate, which is inocular. That white exudate will lead to further infection, and during all the spring period and early summer period, you can have a number of infections, which always leads to more inoculum, more infection. And the report describe a, a phase of the disease where the pathogen survives and epiphytes on the leaf and, and uh, occasionally uh, infect, infect the plants. So, when we, when we transform all of this in when infection occurs, we find that infection occurs in two periods of the year, spring and early summer, and during autumn. And when we compared that, that, that was hypothesis with what was happening in Italy, we had a pretty good match. However, if you look, when, if you look at what happened in New Zealand, when you have the disease in New Zealand, you might recall that graph from this morning, so this is very authentic. That is about a year after the first discovery of, of, of PSA in New Zealand, and we have a huge area here which has been infected by PSA. And if we're looking at the number of orchards which get infected over time, we find that there's clearly some period where infection seems to be occurring faster than others, but the number of time we have a plateau means no new infection is extremely limited. The model that was working well for Italy, the model that could predict what was happening in Italy, is simply not working in New Zealand. And in this, uh, yeah, I first go back to, uh, to the, the Japanese experiment. The Japanese also had PSA. They were actually the first one to have PSA. They did a lot of work on epidemiology, and they came to a number of conclusions. They came to the conclusion that the disease was less active above 20 degrees Celsius, and if you're above 25 degrees Celsius, you do not get any infection. The disease is most active when the average temperature over a 10-day period is between 10 and 10, 20 degrees Celsius. The epiphytic population, which is in your inoculum, decrease when temperature goes up. And that same epiphytic population increase in fall when the temperature goes down. All that matches very well with the model we had for Italy. And if you take that into account, you understand why the model that was working for Italy was not working for New Zealand. You do not reach those very high temperatures in the summer. And so for New Zealand, the conclusion we came up to is that in actual fact, unfortunately, infection could occur all year round. I didn't put an arrow here during the middle of summer. You can have some short period of time where it is relatively dry, and at that time the infection seems to slow down, and during winter it is difficult to know how much real infection is actually taking place. I'm going now to, uh, to change subject, and I'm going to look at where is the inoculum. That's told us what happens around the year, when you have the pathogen and the plant together. Where is the inoculum coming from? So a lot of work has been done in New Zealand and we looked at where PSA would survive. So this is a shelter belt, which is supposedly representing an orchard. You have here the kiri fruit, which is trapped in the two leaves. <coughs> and, and we looked at where PSA survived. We looked at the leaf surface, we looked in the cane, on the cane, in the cane, on the fruit stock, we looked uh, on, on, on the leaders, we looked inside the trunk, outside the trunk, we looked on the shelter belt, we looked on the weeds, the leaf on the ground, the soil, the pruning, and the water. I won't go through all of it, but I'll present what I believe is the most important for, for, for people in the So first, let's look at survival on leaves and cane, something that came already a couple times uh, today. The experiment consisted of picking up some, some leaves that were infected from a naturally infected uh, orchard. And those leaves came during the fall, and they were separated in two groups. One group was kept in frames in, in the orchard, while the other one was brought in the laboratory. Similarly, we took some canes. Those canes we call them potentially infected, because they were canes that were associated with dieback. But whether the bacteria was in those canes or not, we couldn't be sure. And again, the canes were in two lots. One lot that was left on the orchard floor, and the other group was brought in the laboratory. 
on regular basis, every week. We would take four leaves and four canes. Isolate the bacteria onto a, a, a medium. So we know that what we isolate is living, so it's not just dead bacteria. And then we confirm that those bacteria are PSA by the PCR uh, protocol. Here are the results for leaf litter. So we have a number of weeks where we did the experiment. And here the number of positive isolates out of the four samples we taken. The dark bars are the samples that were in the laboratory, and the lighter one are the one in the field. When we started the experiment, four samples out of four samples carried PSA. A week later, the, the, from the sample in the laboratory, only two and four were the four from the field. Those negative should not be interpreted as the bacteria disappear. Has to be interpreted that in the sample we had, the bacteria was not present, which is very, diffi very different. So when we see a positive, we can be sure <coughs> PSA was there. We had the bacteria, it was multiplying. A negative means perhaps we missed the bacteria, it might have been below the level of detection, it might have been masked by other microorganisms, or simply in that small sample we looked at, PSA was not there. So with that in mind, the interpretation of that graph is that up to 15 weeks, 15 weeks after the beginning of the experiment, we still could isolate PSA from leaves that were kept in the laboratory or in the field. We look at the results from the cane material, and they're the same implied. In actual fact, it's a bit uh, more difficult because we only came and we didn't know whether PSA was there or, or not in the cane. So again, a positive guarantee PSA is there, negative we can't. And, uh, and in this case, we have positive, we could isolate PSA, living PSA from canes 11 weeks after the beginning of the experiment, whether the cane was in the lab or the cane was kept in the field. The other thing we looked at was shelter belts. In New Zealand, it's a relatively windy country. We have here a picture from orchards near Tipuki. So this is Kirkwood Orchard. And you see there's a lot of shelter belts to protect the crop from, from the wind. The question was, could the shelter belt harbor PSA? Could PSA multiply on that shelter belt and, and therefore lead to more disease in, in the orchard? So the experiment here was slightly different. We worked with Cryptomeria japonica, which is the tree which is used the most often for shelter belts. So this is what Cryptomeria japonica looks like. We inoculated those, some, some potted plants with PSA, and on a regular basis we take one gram of plant, randomly uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the infected plant or inoculated plant, isolate the bacteria, again to be sure we're talking about live cell, the multiplying PSA, and we confirm it's PSA by PCR. In this, in, this, in this table, we have little circle, which represents the population of PSA. We have on each sample of cryptomeria, and we have three samples per, uh, per, per time point. We have to do this because the, each sample was slightly different and wanted to account for the variability. So we start with relatively high population. This is 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8. So that's 10 to 100 million bacteria per gram of, of, of the cryptomeria. And rapidly, those population decrease such as to be below our level of detection, which was 100 bacteria per gram of tissue. So on those, on those cryptomeria, PSA was not multiplying. It was only able to survive for a relatively short period of time. Cryptomeria is not the only plant species used for shelter belts. There is a couple of others, such as uh, pine, Pinus radiata, and Cassiarina pinigrianumana. And there are a number of experiments. We start by inoculating a relatively high population. We took 10 to the 8th, so that's 100 million uh, bacteria uh, per, per, per milliliter. And, and the trees were only sprayed with that. And for the, for the case of pine, it takes between one and two days for those very high population of PSA to drop below our level of detection. 
So again, PSA was not surviving on, on, on pi. Castuary now, situation slightly different. We start with high population again. It seems that PSA is able to survive a little bit longer, three to four days on the But clearly no multiplication, and it's just a matter of time for the population to disappear below, below the volume pressure. Now we look at compost. So we took some compost that was prepared in the country where there was a lot of nutrients. Those composts were made from green tissue but non kiwi fruit. We never found PSA in any of those compost. However, we were wondering what would happen if PSA would be by accident deposited in the compost. Could PSA survive? So we have here three different composts. They were different type of compost, maybe different material. We inoculated at a very high level. We have a thousand bacteria per gram of compost. And in a matter of days, the population of PSA dropped, dropped, and disappeared. We did the same experiments with soil. We got the same results. With soil, it was even a little faster. PSA was not able to multiply and disappeared very rapidly. PSA is an aerial pathogen. It is not uh, adapted to be able to survive in the soil. Then we looked in water, and water is important because we have established previously a certain link between water and some serine. So we were wondering what what is the uh, what the situation. So we started with uh, with some tap water, tap water from Hamilton. It's fantastic water because you can take it straight from the tap, non-treated, you autoclave or you filter, it doesn't matter. Sometimes in three hours the case is dead. Which is fantastic results. This is perhaps not the water you want to drink the day. There's a number of chemicals in that water. If now you take pure water and you look at survival of PSA. Well, you start again with the high population. It takes much longer here for PSA to die and disappear. Interpretation is that here PSA disappear because of some chemicals that in the tap water. Here PSA disappear because in pure water there is no nutrients. The water out there is slightly different. So we did now an experiment with rainwater. So we have rainwater as two experiments. Rainwater that was straight taking from after the rain, and rainwater which we autoclave or filter. That autoclave or filtered water is water in which we remove the microorganism but nothing else. In this case, we have, so let's look at the results. There is actually here two, <coughs> two lines, one green and one orange. And the population of PSA dropped very rapidly. In a matter of days, you don't find your PSA anymore. That is water, rainwater, which is non-treated. And that non-treated rainwater, PSA, has difficulty to survive for more than a couple of days. And again, that is starting with extremely high population. <laughs> On the other hand, if now you sterilize your, your, your rainwater, it seems that PSA is able to multiply and survive. The explanation we the hypothesis is in the rainwater, there's a lot of microorganisms. The microorganisms compete with PSA. PSA is not adapted to compete very well with other microorganisms, and therefore its, its survivability is limited. While if you remove the competition, there is probably enough nutrients in the rainwater for PSA to survive. OK, now I'm going to, 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 to move to another field, and I'm going to, to look at so port of entry and movement of PSA within the plant, and we will have here a little bit of electron microscopy and some of the picture we're talking about we're taking by both of the and iron ions. So by the way, this is a PSA, this is a cell of PSA, <coughs> other bacteria, this is our enemies here with some beautiful flagella. Okay, so let's look at leaf inoculation or leaf infection. So this is a leaf here that was inoculated, and some of the first symptoms you will see is this discoloration. It, 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 it becomes water soft. It looks like it, it is full of water. That's one of the first symptoms you're going to see after, after uh, inoculation. If you look very carefully to some of the symptoms on the leaf, you will see some necrosis coming in, and here 
drops of accident. But those drop of accident again pure bacterial culture of food. Now we look at the leaf which has been cut and so this is the top of the leaf and this is here the uh, uh, actual sides of the, the bottom side of the leaf. The tissue have been colored with coloring blue and, and the bacteria come into in, in, in that color. So after inoculation, so the bacteria was sprayed on the underside of the leaf, where the bacteria five days later, the bacteria is here, there, here, and there. And those here are the stomata. It is through the stomata that the bacteria enter. If we look at now a natural peace spot, something that was brought from the field, and we can see where is the bacteria, again to in blue uh, coloration, and we need to increase a little bit to see where they are. We have here uh, plant cells, and we have the bacteria that are sitting right here between, in the space between the plant cells. Let's look at the stomata, so it's electron microscopy on the side of the leaf. The stomata is, is, uh, is right here. That is the stomata, and with the, with the opening here, and behind that you have the stomatal chamber. After uh, spraying the bacteria, so it's one day after inoculation, you see the, the, the bacteria right there, a little bit everywhere. We probably a little bit more high concentration of PSA getting into the plant through that stomata. If we wait a little bit, Five days later, what happens? Now, the population of PSA in that stomata is much, much higher. While the bacteria that are outside uh, disappears. Let's wait a little bit longer. And now here we have a mass of bacteria which seems to be extruding out of the stomata. To be, to, to, to be honest, it's probably partly an artifact, and when we prepare the tissue, the tissue might have been compressed a little bit, and some of those bacteria might have been inside the stomach chamber, and they popped out when, when the tissue was prepared. But that does show the amount of bacteria and where the bacteria is after inoculation. If now we remove the, 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 the epidermis, we have raised where we have this uh, stomata, and we look at the tissue beneath it. We have here the, 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 the tissue, so all that is plant cell, and over oh, here, what do we have? Our bacteria. Let's look closer. Yes, indeed, it is, it is also not showing the activity, it is bacteria. So that, that, that is the bacteria. Now, we, we, we look again at the tissue, with are in blue, <coughs> the stomata, the bacteria that are coming out of the stomata and they're here. Again, it might be that those bacteria were really in the stomatal chamber and when the cut was made, they were pushed out. But what, what is interesting is that underneath, we have this like, network of fibers that uh, people believe is extra for the saccharide. So that the sugar produced by the bacteria. If we go back to electron microscopy, we do find that, that uh, that kind of tissue, and in that tissue, if you look carefully, you will find the PSA, right here, right there, <coughs> back to the here, and then one here, there. Okay, natural infection. The only reason I wanted to show that slide is because in that, in that slide, we have PSA into the vascular bundle. And of course, when you think that, that, that PSA is a vascular bundle, you think that PSA can sort of move into the plant, it can move outside the, uh, the, 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 the nucleus area. Let's look now, let's talk about movements, and let's look at a uh, PSA uh, here in the cortex. So this is, this is uh, the cane that was taken uh, in spring 2011. You can see the uh, but started to open up, but never developed very well. They have some exudates there. When you cut, you find discoloration of the tissue. So classic uh, PSA symptoms. Infected canes. So we go over the tissue later, but here we have basically the xylem. You see that this area is affected. It 
doesn't, it doesn't develop as, as a rest and have a discoloration of those tissues. If we look closer, so that is now the xylem, so the holes here are the xylem vessels that carry the sap, and, and here we have, we have the uh, xylem fibers. And that discoloration here indicates that the plant is reacting to something which is there, that something which is there. So, a little bit of anatomy. We won't go really into the detail, but this is a penetrated cave. And, and when you cut, you have on the, so this is the outside, then you have the bar, you have a number of cells, the parenchyma, outer parenchyma, some fibers, inner parenchyma, phloem, cambium, and here finally your, 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 your xylem. What happened after uh, infection? After infection, we have area which are completely filled by, by, by the bacteria, and you can see the bacteria moving to the fibers and colonizing the parenchyma uh, and the leaves. If we, if we look more closely, we have here bacteria between the cells. Dead pathogenic bacteria do not infect the cells, they multiply between the plant cells, and that's exactly what, what, what the point here. And here you see the bacteria kind of sneaking in and, and moving out, and, and, and moving in the, uh, in the tissue and the mixture. So this is area here, which is the bacteria. How we imagine the bacteria is moving? The bacteria is multiplying as long as it can find some nutrients, so that suddenly we have a lot of bacteria. They have an exopolysaccharide, it's like a sugar, a round thing. When water is available, that acts like a sponge, and so it takes a lot of space, it creates pressure, and that pressure pushes, pushes the bacteria outside an area and into another one. And of course that pressure will, will simply put the bacteria, or the bacteria going to move, wherever it will be less resistance. Sometimes the less resistance will be towards the center of the plant, sometimes going down, sometimes going up, and sometimes going out. And the going out is when you see that the drop of what exudates, which is that pure bacterial culture, uh, this inocular, which is so dangerous for PSA. Okay, so now this is, this is with the same picture on the left. <coughs> on the right, what, what has been done, some antibody which are specific of PSA and it can fluorize under certain conditions have been used. And so you vi visualize it better where PSA is in the tissue and you can see the colonization of the intercellular space. White exudate, so here a couple pictures of the white exudate I was just talking in a minute where the bacteria is pushed out and follow the path of least resistance. This is a Bruno plant. Bruno is used in New Zealand as a rootstock. And when the plant on, on top is, is, is sick, like a whole 16 we cut and usually cut into the Bruno or into the plant. Doing so, we observed a number of times that outside the cut you had those white, that white ooze coming out, which looks like suspiciously the white ooze we have on the leaves or on the cane that are infected. It looks like this white ooze, which turned out to be sonocerium actinidae, it's like this white ooze is coming out of the xylem. So let's look. First, a little, a little picture about the intensity of the phenomenon. 20 minutes after this uh, Bruno was cut, you have, you have a little bit of ooze. 24 hours later, you have huge drops of the, of the bacteria coming out. This shows the ability of PSA to multiply when you give it nutrients. So this is, this is, this is the, the, the tissue, and, and here the xylem we talked about, with the xylem vessels and here the, the, the fibers. If you look a little bit closer, can we find the PSA? Well, just look uh, closer. And so here you have the fibers and there is some bacteria. But we'll see better on that pictures where you have here all the bacteria covering some of it. Okay, all right. <laughs> 
So, 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 so now we, we, we go back to, 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 to the Zion and the Zion. So we can imagine the Zion as a cube in which the sap goes, but this, in that cube from time to time there is a sap that, that, that joins to, uh, to tubes. And here we have such, such a sap. And you find on that, on that, on that side here a huge flood of bacteria of sedimentary activity. <coughs> When you have such a massive amount of bacteria, it does flood, it does flood the vessels. The plant has more than one vessel, but if all the vessels suddenly would get colonized in that intensity, you can imagine that the sap wouldn't be able to flow, and that does explain the symptoms we were looking at earlier, which is the shoot dieback and the wilting. And that wilting can, of course, <laughs> happen very rapidly. It just, it just has to, 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 to depend on how far the bacteria can. So there is now uh, another another pictures of that flat between between xylem uh, <coughs> tubes, and here we have the bacteria that start to multiply. If you look a bit closer, so this this is this is this is the, the plaque with little holes, so the sap goes through the holes. When you look at the bacteria, you think the bacteria could sneak in. The reality is bacteria usually do not multiply and they stay isolated. They like to make a macro colony, and when you have a macro colony, it is how you integrate those, those, uh, those tissues. Okay, so in summary, we, 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 we develop a general and theoretical life cycle of, of PSH. What was very important of the, the lesson was that this life cycle is dependent on the environmental conditions. So if you're in different parts of the world, you need to interpret the, the, the symptoms you have and you have a different cycle. What was working well for Japan or Italy is not working for New Zealand because our climatic conditions are different and in Italy, Italy you need to have something different again. PSS survives very well in infected tissue. That was the cane and the leaves where they were kept in the lab or on the outer floor. However, outside here with tissue, so far we have not identified plants or, or anywhere else where the bacteria would be able to survive and, and, and to multiply. And so what we look at is shelter belts, the weeds, soil, compost, and the rain. Any opening can constitute a, a port of entry. The bacteria, which is outside the plant, will multiply. And the first opening, whether it's natural, whether it's artificial, the bacteria will take that opportunity to get in the plant, to multiply, and get nutrients, and then, and then move in the plant. In some cases, you have a rapid multiplication of the bacteria in the intercellular space of the paraclima and that explains some of the symptoms we've seen, some, such as production of exudates and discussion of the tissue. And the colonization of the zion of the cells and associated fiber explain the sudden collapse and the wilting that we can observe sometimes in the And the 